chapter 32, chapter 32, let's all stand together, verses 1 to 14 today, uh, verses 1 to 14, and then also verse 32, but we'll get to verse 32 in a minute. The Bible says in verse 1, chapter 32, now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, come make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Uh, so a little opportunity for leadership for Aaron, and uh, he fails pretty bad. Verse 2, and Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Uh, then verse 4, fail number 2, pretty bad, it gets worse. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Man, that's, that's bad. It's bad. Look, it gets worse. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, and this is just like crazy confusing, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. So all capital letters for the word Lord, that's the name of God, Yahweh, most likely. So a golden cap at the center, and he says this really confusing thing, tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. By the way, that, it's not like they had, it's not like they had um, a potluck and then played Monopoly. It's, it's, it's worse than that. <clears throat> Verse 7, and the Lord said to Moses, go, get down. I think disco when I read that for some reason. I, I don't know why. It, it happened this morning. It was so bad. And then I just started laughing uncontrollably. And the Lord said to Moses, go get down for your people whom you brought out, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They've made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Was God happy about this? No, look, and the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my, my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath Burn hot against your people whom you, he kicks it back to God, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land that I've spoken of, I give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. So Moses intercedes, he prays, check out what happens here, verse 14, so the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Father, thank you so much for this story today. It's not an accident, God, that you've ordained us to be in this chapter. And Father, to learn from the example of Moses who stepped up courageously in a very difficult time and interceded, interceded for the people. God, he bore your heart, a desire for grace. Father, you had formed and fashioned him and shaped him for this very moment. And I pray, God, that we would follow his example. And God, in the difficult moment that we're in, that we wouldn't step away from you, but that we would step towards you. God, that we would step up courageously, that we would be able to see what it is that you are doing. God, to see beyond our fear and to see beyond panic and to, to be courageous right now. God, that's what you've called us to be. And so, Father, speak to us. God, speak over your people and help us, Lord, to align ourselves to your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat today. 
<clears throat> you know, uh, sometimes, sometimes I'm surprised when I'm surprised because I have, as a pastor, I've seen a lot and, and you know, I'm not, foolish, I'm not foolish enough to say that I've seen everything because I know I haven't seen everything. But there are times where I'm like, man, I've seen so much crazy stuff, you know, that, that nothing really surprises me anymore. And so when I do, hey, by the way, we have two of our favorite missionaries here with us this morning from the UK, Rich and Sue Lackey are with us. Would you welcome them today? Stand up for a second, guys. All right, hey, they, they are amazing. Uh, we love them. God has used them for so many years to reach the Middle East with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I uh, want to encourage you guys to be praying for them. So where was I? Um, you know, but I will say this, you know, that, that I do, when I am surprised, I'm surprised that I'm surprised because I've seen a lot, um, and I am surprised right now. I am surprised right now. I'm not necessarily surprised at um, a virus um, I am surprised a little bit at the reaction to the virus. And, you know, right now we're all dealing with hard realities. I know that sometimes as human beings, we want to be able to push these difficult things aside. We sometimes wish we wouldn't have to deal with hard realities in life because they're uncomfortable, you know, they sometimes hurt. And so we try to mitigate and self-protect and insulate as much as possible. But there are times where there's just hard stuff for us to deal with. And, you know, we're, we're faced with that. We're faced with not only the reality, the difficult reality of a virus that's now been considered um, a pandemic, but we're also dealing with the, the results of the response to it. And you know, over the last week and a half or two weeks, we've really been encouraging you to respond the right way. And so we've advised you, hey, listen, be practical, right? The three Ps of how we respond. Be practical, be wise. Um, we don't, we're not ignorant of the issues that we're dealing with. We don't just bury our heads in the sand. God has called us to live our lives wisely, and this is a book of wisdom. From the first word to the last word of the book, it is a book of wisdom. But even in this book of wisdom, there's books of wisdom, like Proverbs is a whole book filled with wisdom. We are called to live our lives wisely, but we're also called to be prayerful people. We are connected with the Almighty God, right? We are con connected to the Almighty God. And so while we live our lives wisely, while, while we choose to make the right decisions, we also know that we're not just left to our own devices. There is a God who is sitting on a throne who takes pleasure in answering the prayers of his people. And so we need to be prayerful. This is what we're going to talk about today. We also need to be proclaimers. We're going to talk about this in a minute as well. Like there is a moment here, like we should always be sharing the gospel. We are great commission Christians, for sure. But in times like this, we need to be publicly proclaiming in love the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and so, you know, we've tried to like give to you the right framework to respond. Uh, we have daily devotionals that are posted on our social media platforms. And just a couple of minutes, you know, I'm working my way through the gospel of Mark and uh, just every day want to be able to get your heart and mind centered on the Lord, centered on his word. Like you need that mindset for your day because once you get out beyond the doors, you know, it's just wild out there. And so, you know, you might be saying, well, why do I need all of that? And my answer to that is because how we respond to COVID-19 is everything. How we respond to this is everything. Now, now, the truth is that difficult situations in life, um, it's hard enough to know how to respond to just normal difficult situations. We're dealing with something that we don't deal with all the time. I mean, there's no, there's no handbook, there's no guidebook on how to deal with the pandemic. But today, I want to move us from panic to courage. That's the focal point of today's message. I want to move us from panic to courage because you know if you're out in the world, have any of you gone shopping this week? Anybody? 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 Like you know there's panic out there, right? And it's like a vacuum. You just feel yourself getting sucked into it. It's all around and it's encroaching into your very life. And if we're not careful, we get consumed in fear. 
We get consumed in panic, and God doesn't want you in that spot. God wants you to walk courageously. Now, you know me. You know how I am, and so I did a little word study on um, panic and courage, and I, I found this very interesting, all right? The word panic is an early 17th century word. It comes from the French word panique, from the Greek panikos, which comes from the name of the god Pan, the false god Pan, who was noted for causing terror. If you go to um, Israel with us and we're down by Caesarea Philippi, that whole area was devoted to the worship of the god Pan. And we'll talk about how the word panic has its root in this false god who was noted for causing terror, who was noted for causing fear. And that is exactly what the devil desires to do in your life right now. You know, flip that to the other side, the word courage can be defined as a mental or moral strength to venture, to persevere, and to withstand danger, fear, or difficulty. Very different etymology of this word. It comes from the Latin word core, which means the heart, which means the heart. So, so I would say to you today that panic comes from the devil, courage comes from God. Panic comes from the devil. Courage comes from God. And so how are we going to live our lives this week? We're going to choose to worship God um, and courageously live for him in the challenging circumstances that are set before us. We are going to worship God by choosing to courageously live for him in the challenging circumstances that are before us. And you know, this is exactly what Moses does. Um, this moment for Moses was a defining moment. It was a defining moment for the children of Israel. And um, I think it was a defining moment for the nations around them. And you know, Moses had multiple ways he could have responded to this situation. And what we're going to do briefly today is we're going to learn from Moses. You know, Moses was confronted with a difficult surprise, something he wasn't expected, very challenging situation. And we are going to learn from how he responded. By the way, he responded in prayer. And I'm grateful that our president has declared today to be a national day of prayer. I'm thankful for that. And, you know, um, of all, a lot of solid steps from uh, the administration, from the vice president and the president, you know, the testing and things like that, I would say the most powerful thing um, that's been done so far is to rally God's people to pray to God. So, you know, very difficult situation. Let me just kind of walk you through the scenario here. Moses was having the time of his life. I mean, Mo Moses is on top of the mountain, marvelous revelation of God, the, the Torah, um, the law of God downloaded to Moses, amazing revelation. Not only that, um, but Moses is um, directed by God to build a tabernacle, a place of worship, detail by detail, going through the furnishings of the tabernacle. And in the midst of this amazing moment where this download is coming, two tablets of stone written with the very finger of God, such an amazing moment for Moses, God breaks into it and he says, hey, your people, Mo, your people that you brought out of Egypt, they have turned aside quickly and now they are worshiping. They're worshiping a false god. And it's so bad that what I'm going to do is I'm going to consume them and I'm going to start a brand new nation with you. Unbeknownst to Moses, I mean, the hard realities for Moses were these. People were sinning, leadership was failing, and there was going to be hard consequences that were coming. Unbeknownst to Moses, at the foot of the mountain, the people got tired of waiting. You know, they were impatient and so their expectation, Moses was going to come down a lot earlier. He wasn't coming down. Their impatience provoked them to develop their own solution to the problem. Instead of looking to God, they looked to man. They looked to Aaron, and they said, hey, uh, where, we don't know what's happened to Moses. You need to make gods for us because, you know, this guy obviously isn't coming down the mountain, and we're not sure what we're going to do from here. So why don't you make us some gods? Aaron's epic failure in this is that he conceded to the will of the people. 
And so what does he do? He has them take all of their gold. He puts it in a smelting pot. He melts the gold down, and then he fashions himself a golden calf, an idol, a false god. And then he sets that false god up on uh, an altar, and in his confusion, he calls a feast, he calls a, a festival, he you know, calls the people to worship this false god in the name of Yahweh. Aaron compromises. I mean, what a confusing statement to say, okay, hey, we're going to put this false god in the center on the altar, and then we're going to have a feast to Yahweh. He compromised. You know, he thought that he could do both at the same time. Later on, he's going to get busted. He's going to get busted, and you know he comes up with maybe the lamest excuse the world has ever seen. Moses is like, dude, I mean, that's my version, dude, are you kidding me? What did you do? He's like, bro, because they're brothers, bro, it wasn't my fault. You know, we threw the gold in, and this golden calf came out, like, that is straight up the lamest excuse that's ever been given on the face of the earth, but he blame shifted. So he failed in his leadership, he compromised, he would ultimately blame shift, and the result was sin was rampant among the people. Sin was rampant among the people. The Bible says that they sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play. That doesn't mean that they had a potluck and they played Monopoly. The, the implication is, in fact, the word to play means to be unrestrained, it means to break loose, it means to run wild, it can, it can even be translated naked. And so what they did is they worshipped this false god like the Egyptians worshipped their false gods. I mean, it was total fornication, ungodliness, and immorality. And all of that because Aaron chose to compromise and ultimately blame shifted. Listen, Aaron had options. Aaron had options. He could have waited on the Lord. He could have said, hey, listen, hold your horses. Just calm down. Take a chill pill. Relax for a minute. Don't panic. Don't freak out. What we need to choose to do is we need to choose to wait on the Lord. You know, what we need to remember is God has always been faithful to us in the past. Like this was a moment for Aaron to step forward and say, you guys, let's look in the rearview mirror. Let's remind ourselves, has God ever let us down? Has God ever failed to provide? Like, hey, let me walk you through step by step, children of Israel. Didn't he part the sea? Didn't he cause the bread to come down from heaven? Didn't he make the water come forth from the, the rock? Let's look backwards so we can look forward. Let's remember what God did. Let's not compromise. Let's not panic. Let's not get consumed. Let's not be so impatient that we develop our own solutions to the issue. Let's look to God. They chose not to do that, and there were hard consequences because of it. Now, listen, the consequences begin with God saying, I am wiping everybody out. I am consuming this nation, and I'm starting over with you. Ultimately, after Moses prays and intercedes, the consequences are limited, and there is abundant grace that is given. God does something. God steps into this situation. God, in fact, moves. Maybe the most important verse here is verse 14 where it says, So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. So what was deservedly coming to the children of Israel was changed by God. The word relent means relief or comfort that comes from changing a course of action from what is undesirable to desirable. It is relief or comfort that comes from changing a course of action from what was undesirable to desirable. So God changes here. God changes his course of action. Listen really carefully to me. God did not change his character in this. His character emerged in this. God was looking for an opportunity to demonstrate his power. God was looking for an opportunity to demonstrate his grace. God desired of all of his qualities and characteristics for his grace to emerge, listen, and his grace emerged through the intercession of Moses. 
Now, I want to remind you that it's not as if God's desire was to destroy everybody and Moses' desire was grace. And so somehow Moses convinced God to be gracious when God really didn't want to be gracious. That's not what's going on here. God had shaped the heart of Moses. God was teaching and instructing Moses that he loved the people, that his desire was for grace. But God has chosen the intercession of his people as a means through which he pours out his grace. Do you understand that today? Listen, Christian, this is important for you to get. And if you get nothing else from this morning, I want you to understand this. God has chosen the intercession of his people as a means through which he pours out his grace. It is always God's desire to be gracious. It is always God's desire to move. In his sovereignty, he has determined that the intercession of his people is the conduit, it is the pathway, it is the trigger through which his grace is released. Look, I I don't know. I don't know what would have happened if Moses didn't intercede here. Maybe God's grace wouldn't have been poured out. How many opportunities for God's grace to be poured out have been missed because his people have chosen not to intercede? You know, in difficult times, we change our perspective from affliction to opportunity. And and by that, I simply mean this. Moses could have been all self-consumed. Moses could have been all self-focused. But Moses wasn't self-focused. He saw that there was an opportunity for God to do something great. And in times of difficulty, times of challenge, when we are tempted to isolate and insulate, where we are tempted to completely and solely focus on self-preservation, if we choose that route, we will miss the opportunity for God to pour out his power, his might, and his grace in challenging times. And so I want to I want to challenge us today. We need to step forward courageously as intercessors right now. We need the church of the living God. Hey, what is the solution? What is the solution to all of this? I, look, I would say to you that God has provided a solution in his people. We need to right now step forward courageously as intercessors. To intercede means to stand in the gap for somebody. It means to stand in the gap with your life. Uh, with prayer and supplication. It means to stand in the gap, understanding and exalting the purposes of God. Look, Moses right now, if he was self-focused, he could have said, you know what, God, it's a good idea. I'm tired of them too. You know, like, (laughs) wipe them out. And I like the idea. You start all over with me. I mean, that just, that just sounds good. It's got a ring to it, you know, like I really, he could have justified it. This really, this is your plan, you know. If he was inward focused, That's what he would have wanted. But Moses was others focused. He was others focused. It took 40 years to build this into the heart of Moses. I think if this situation happened 40 years earlier, it would have been a no-brainer for Moses because everything would have been all about himself. Listen, three things today, and I I want you to write these down or, you know, type them on your notes app, whatever it may be. Um, We need to be stepping forward courageously as intercessors. How do we do that? You might today be thinking, Pastor, you know, I'm just, I'm having a hard time. Like, I'm emotionally overwhelmed. I'm afraid. I'm consumed with panic. Let me guide you through this, okay? Because I want you to leave today um, being courageous. Number one, being for God makes us courageous. Being for God makes us courageous. I want to reread Moses' prayer And then I'm going to flip to verse 32 because he prays again to God and what he prays is really profound. So verse 11 says, then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you've you've brought out of the land of Egypt? He flips it back with great power and and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Like, even though they deserve it, God, choose a different course of action. Demonstrate your grace. Remember, he says, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it for how long? 
forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. And then flip over to verse 32. You have to, you have to check this out. So beginning in verse 31, um, Moses praying again says, then Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray blot me out of your book, which you have written. So listen, number one, to be courageous in this time as an intercessor, we need to remember that we need to be for God. We need to be for God. This was what Moses' intercession was based on. As Moses is praying, I just want you to think about the content of Moses' prayer. He bases uh, the outpouring of God's grace, he bases his intercession on the glory of God and the promises of God, on the glory of God and on the promises of God. He essentially says to God, hey, listen, don't do this because you delivered your people with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and if you consume them, the Egyptians will say that you just brought them out to the desert to destroy them. So for the sake of your glory, God, for the sake of your glory. And God, not only that, but you remember your promises to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Israel, that you would make of them a great nation. God, that you would bless all nations through them, that God, you would bring the Messiah. And so his, the framework of his prayer isn't about himself. The framework of his, of, of his prayer is about God. It is about the glory of God. It is about the promises of God. You know, when we are all about ourselves, when we yield to the temptation to look inward and to be overwhelmed by the situations and circumstances around us, we get consumed by the fear of loss. We get consumed by the fear of loss. Financial loss, people loss, loss of control. You guys know that control is just a mirage. It's an illusion. The only one that's really in control is God. Loss of influence, loss of health. I'm not saying that we aren't to live our lives wisely, but I am saying that the only one who really holds those things in, in his hand is God. And if we're not careful, what happens is, as everyone else is, is consumed with self, we find ourselves consumed with ourselves as well. And you, all you have to do is go to the store. Anybody go shopping this week? My, oh my, oh my, oh my. Somebody took a picture of Sam's Club or Costco this morning for me, and I wish the lines to get into church were as long as the lines at Sam's Club and Costco. You know, intercession, when you choose to be an interceder, you are moving from being just for yourself to being for others and for God. And look, I think that God is waiting for his people to take up his cause. God is waiting for people to live beyond themselves. God is waiting for his people to be able to say, God, I am more concerned. I'm more concerned with your glory than I am my comfort. God, I believe that you are in control. God, I believe that none of this has taken you by surprise. God, I believe that you've not abdicated your power to the adversary. And so, Father, I pray, yeah, I'm going to give you my supplications and petitions for myself, but ultimately what I'm aiming for is this, God, do whatever it takes to bring yourself the most glory. Father, shape the circumstances, shape the situation, show me how I can live my life in such a way where your glory is exalted through me. Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, Jesus had been teaching his disciples how to pray, and he wraps the model prayer up with this statement, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, amen. When you are interceding, make sure you are um, primarily praying for the glory of God. Not only that, but Moses bases his intercession, and remember, the whole purpose of intercession was for God to pour out his grace. So God, pour out your grace because we want you to get the glory. God, pour out your grace so that your promises might be fulfilled. L let me just say this. You know, I think that, that um, leaders are taking good steps. I think that the administration has taken good steps. But what we want is for God to get the glory here. 
We're not looking for a president to get the glory or a vice president or pastors in a church. We want people to see the glory of God manifested in the midst of this difficult circumstance. And God will do that if we pray. God will do that if we pray. So we ask for God's glory to be um, exalted. And then we also, like Moses, we pray for God to fulfill his promises. Moses here, he says to God, remember. It's not like Moses thought that God had amnesia. You know, God, God, Moses was just praying back the word of God to God. If you don't know what to pray in your life, I want to encourage you, pray the word of God to God. Why? Is it because God doesn't know what he said in his word? That's for sure not the case. But when you are praying God's word, you know you're praying according to the will of God. And God has promised to answer our prayers if we are praying according to his will. Not only that, but I think Moses needed the reminder himself. I think it was a good process for Moses to go through to remind not just God, but himself that God would be faithful to his promises. And so I want to remind you today, God will be faithful to his promises, the promises that he has made to you as sons and daughters of the living God. We need to come to a place in our life as interceders where beyond our, the, the prayers for ourselves, we are praying, God, fulfill your promises. We want you to fulfill your promises even more than our temporary satisfaction. Look, when you start to develop this type of framework in your prayer life, it changes your perspective and it causes your prayers to be powerful. You move to another level spiritually. The second thing I want to encourage you with today that I see in Moses' prayer is this, knowing God's plan makes us courageous. Knowing God's plan makes us courageous. Now, this Point, point two, is tied to the last point of point one. And I think that Moses understood God's plan for the nation of Israel. He understood it. Look, he, listen, listen, he understood the big picture. He understood the big picture. This was a difficult moment in time, but because Moses understood the big picture of what it was that God was doing, this is really important for you right now. Listen. Because he understood the big picture of what it was that God was doing, he was able to put this blip, this moment of time in its place. You know, he knew because God was going to fulfill his promises. He knew that God would bring the nation of Israel through this. And I want to remind you today, and I say this with all confidence, God is going to bring us through this. God is going to bring us through this. God will be faithful. God will be faithful. God will be faithful to himself. God will be faithful to his promises. God will be faithful to you. Listen, the pandemonium in the world does not kick God off of his throne. And so we need to remember, listen, get your eyes off of yourself. Get your eyes off of other people. Shut the news off. Shut it off. Look, if, you, if the news, you know me, you know me, you know me, like I, I, I'm a news junkie, I am, and so this isn't always easy for me because I want to stay in touch with what's happening. But if the news is going on all the time in your home, expect your home to be filled with panic and fear. You know, listen to the news, but limit, limit the amount. Choose worship. Choose the word of God. Choose to pray. Pastor, man, I'm, I'm all like, my life's upside down. You know, it's crazy out there and it's all encroached in my life. Well, well what are you watching online? You know, what's, what's filling your home? And so, look, we, we need to remember God's ultimate plan. God has a bigger picture in mind. We are going to look back on this at some point in time and we're going to say, hey, man, God was faithful, wasn't he? God was faithful. That felt like it was going to last forever, but it didn't. You know, God got us through that. God got us through it. God is able. God is able to do that. God can take difficult circumstances and he can use them for his divine purposes. Now, there are some out there today, I have to just address this, there are some out there today who are saying, you know, and they're representing themselves as Christian leaders and spokespersons for God, hey, COVID-19 is God's judgment on this nation or on this world. And listen, really? Really? Are you really that in touch with God? Are you, are you that level of uh, prophet 
that you can speak so definitively that you know God's purposes to that very detail? Look, I, I, don't, I don't think anyone's in a place where they're able to declare that. And frankly, I would say to you, it's not very helpful right now. That, that's not helpful. You know, I've been present um, in times of real difficulty in our nation. You know, I was at, in New York right after 9-11. I was at Katrina. I was in New Orleans right after Katrina. And, you know, there were people who were like, well, this is God's judgment. And being somebody who was present trying to minister to people during those times, I'm telling you, that message doesn't help anybody. That message does not help anybody. Now, I can say definitively that, that COVID-19 for sure is a consequence of Adam's sin. We live in a fallen world, and we are suffering today the decisions that an individual made 6,000 plus years ago. We'll all have words with them, okay? We'll all have words with them. Hey, dude, really? Like, bad decision, son. Bad decision. We are living in a fallen world, and there's no way around that. We are experiencing the consequences of sin, but I believe that we're going to be able to say, and we can say this now, that God was gracious enough to take this difficulty, to take this virus, and to use it as a way to draw humanity to himself. That's what God is doing. And I want to say to you boldly today, God is at work. You know, you say, well, where is God? I say to you, God is where he's always been. He's doing what he always does. God is working. God is working in this moment. And there is a window of willingness in people's lives that we need to take advantage of. It is in moments like this that the unbelieving person is open to God and is confronted with the reality of their own mortality. It is in moments like this that people are really thinking, hey, what does happen when I die? Is there life after death? I know this because I've been there with people, whether it's after 9-11 or Katrina or some flood or some international tragedy, the earthquake in Haiti. Like there's a window of time where people are open to the Lord. And I'm saying to you, it is a short period of time. That window closes. When life goes back to business as usual, people turn off from God and they turn back on to themselves. But if we're not careful, if we're all about self-preservation, if we're all about hoarding the toilet paper for ourselves, <laughs> you know, if we're all self-consumed, we're not going to care about the window of willingness in other people's lives because we're, we'll only be concerned with ourselves. God is at work. We pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. Um, could it be that God is going to use this to bring a great awakening? Could it be that God is going to use this to touch the neighbor that you've been praying for? Look, if we're all focused inward, we're going to miss the opportunity. Jesus said in John 17, 1, he's praying to the Father and he says, glorify your son that your son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. There is a connection between the glory of the Father, the glory of the Son, and the giving of everlasting life. So when you're in line for groceries... When you're in line for groceries, when you're working through the issue of social distancing, when people around you are freaking out, and people around us are freaking out. We went to the store, we went to Smith's to do some normal shopping the other day, and it was insane. It was crazy, and you could feel it. You could feel it. The unbelieving person around you doesn't just need to be tested. They need the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they need. That's who they need. Sometimes, sometimes to be brought to the cross, we need to be brought to our knees. The third thing and final thing today is this, focusing on God's love makes us courageous. Focusing on God's love makes us courageous. So Moses, he prays a crazy prayer, you know, and it's not crazy for the person whose heart is filled with the love of God. He's like, God, listen, be gracious to them, be merciful to them, fulfill your promises. God, act in a way, change the plan. They deserve this, there's no doubt, but God, change the course, Demonstrate your mercy and grace, pour out your power, and God, if you're not going to do it to them, I pray you would blot my name out of the book of life instead. Take the justice that they deserve and pour it out on me. Now, why did Moses pray this? You know, was it just a, a, a prayer of meaningless words? I don't think so. 
I don't think so. I think Moses really loved the people. I think Moses loved the people. How was it that Moses was brought to a place where he loved these people this much? I believe Moses loved these people this much because he had experienced the love of God himself. He had experienced the love of God himself. You can't love like that unless you've been touched by the love of God. You can't live your life beyond yourself unless you've been touched with the love of God. You can't live as an intercessor. You can't stand in the gap. You can't lay your life down unless you've been connected to the one who laid his life down for you. And so I just want to remind all of us today that God loves people. God loves people. God loves people. You, you know, I, I have friends, you know, and they're so like locked into their eschatology, their end time stuff. They're like, hey, listen, Derek, you know, signs of the times, bro. Signs of the times, you know, pest, earthquakes in various places and pestilences and you know some people just got to die and I'm like dude I'm putting you in quarantine <laughs> because because you are so detached from theology you are so detached from the heart of God God's heart is not is not that any should perish but that all should come to everlasting life that is the heart of God God loves people God loves people, and if God loves people, we need to make the decision to love people too. We need to love in the midst of this tension, and it is tension. Like I said, we went to the store the other day, and we've got our little cart, and it's like bumper cars, you know? I mean, you can, you can feel the frustration. You can feel the frustration. You can feel the tension in the air. It's like there are some people who just want to rip someone's head off because I think it'll make them feel better. And if it's that bad in the store, you know it's that bad on the road. Like, there's tension everywhere, and we need to bring the love of God into the tension. We need to make decisions to love. You say, how do I do that? You got two packs of toilet paper. Give one to somebody else. <laughs> God, God, will, God will provide you another solution. Trust me. <laughs> you'll be all right. You'll be all right. Everyone else might not be, but you'll be all right. Look, share, share, love, love the weak, you know, love the marginalized, love the vulnerable, love the suffering. Now, if the, if the body of Christ is, if the church of the, of the living God is not going to do that right now, who is? Like, we are so tempted to just do what everyone else is doing, and I wonder if this is, I wonder if the church will shine in this moment. I wonder if the church will shine. You know, I'm connected to a ton of leadership resources, and I've got friends, you know, who are writing articles for, you know, nationally syndicated magazines and things like that, and there's good information, and there's good guidance, but what's missing almost in every article I have read is an initiative for the people of God to pray. I, I'm shocked. I'm shocked right now. I'm shocked that there's such an absence. People are leaning on the leadership of man, but they're not looking to the power of God. Where is the mobilization? You know, where is the exhortation? Where, where is the call for God's people to do what only God's people can do? Who else can intercede on behalf of the world and invite a loving God to move into, in, in a difficult situation. Only the church is able to do that. And you know what? This isn't as much an issue of how the world is responding. This is an issue of how we are going to respond. Are we going to be courageous? Are we going to be the interceders? Are we going to love? When everyone else wants to focus inward and preserve themselves, are we going to be the ones who will love? Every decision that this church makes is made with love in mind. You know, we want to encourage people. Hey, we're going to meet until they tell us we can't meet. However, if you're at risk, you're an at-risk demographic, it's okay. You can watch from home. We are working hard to make sure that our services are online, that pastors are available to pray for you. If you're sick, stay at home. Call a doctor. Call a medical professional. Gather together in small groups. Watch the service online. Plug into your home group. With all of the social distancing, there's going to be a... a temptation for us to distance ourselves relationally from each other. That's not what God wants right now. There's going to be a temptation for us to hoard to ourselves and to not love people who are in need. You know, a great example of doing this the right way was the widow's ministry this week. Our widows, you, know what, you want to know what the widows did this week? 
they gathered together and they went through this property. They prayed for every office. They prayed for every room. They came into this sanctuary. They prayed for you. They anointed the gates with oil. They declared the power of the name of Jesus and his supremacy over the devil and over his wickedness and evil. And so, so listen, I'm going to give you a word, and I want to remind you today, God can save, God can heal, God can stop a virus, God can awaken a nation, and God can awaken the world. And that's how we need to live through this situation. Hey, let me call, come full circle today, just a closing verse, and I, I want you to stand this morning. I'm going to have the worship team come up today, and, um, and I, I just want you, I want you to meditate on this and tether yourself to it and live this out this week, all right? And we're going to read this verse all together, um, so I want you to read it in faith, um, read it courageously, and, um, and believe it this week. John 3, 16, the Bible says, say it out loud, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. God, we love you. God, we love you, and we thank you that we can trust in you. God, in the hardest times in human history, it was the Christians who rose up and chose to live courageously. And Father, we, we don't want to miss it. We don't want to miss the opportunity. We don't want to turn inward. God, we don't want to be consumed with panic, which we know is from the adversary. It comes from the devil. It's not from you. God, we want to live courageously. We want you to touch our hearts. God, we not only want that, but we want to intercede. Father, we ask that you would be gracious. We ask that you would move powerfully. God, we pray that you would change the course of this virus in a way that no man, no private tech company could ever get the credit or the glory. God, that you would move in such a way that even the unbelieving person would have to agree that it was you, God, that it was you, that you did it. Father, we pray that you would choose the course that would bring you the most glory. God, we pray that you would choose the course that would draw the most souls into heaven. God, we pray that you would fill us with your love, that we would live self-sacrificially in these times. God, show each of us how we can do that. And Father, I pray that as you speak that into our heart, God, that that we would walk boldly. We would have the boldness of a lion, God, the courage to be able to step forward in faith and believe that you're gonna do it, God. You're gonna do it. We trust you. God, we pray that you would awaken, spiritually awaken our families, our neighbors, our city, our nation, and the world. Lord, we love you with our whole hearts today. And Father, we pray for this church, God, that we would be mobilized to pray like we have never prayed before.